everybody. This is Dr. Neha Chaudhary, and I'm here with my teen co-host, Hazuri Dillon. Last time, we spoke with actor and recording artist Chris Mann, and after the episode ended, the conversation didn't. We had such a great time speaking with Chris that we all just kept going, and there was so much to talk about, and things started getting so real, and he was so gracious with his time. So as a bit of a surprise for our listeners, we thought we'd release and share the entire conversation. So here's part two of Being Me with our guest, recording artist, Chris Mann. Okay, let's talk about The Phantom. That's such an iconic role. Can you tell us about your audition experience? Were you nervous? And then how did you handle the pressure of auditioning for such a high profile role? Yes, Phantom and mental health. Yes, let's play it mentally unstable character. At this point, I'd been on The Voice. I had done a couple of records with Universal. I had been touring a lot. And I found myself being kind of bored and not thrilled and wanting a change. And so I went to my agents and I was like, hey, doing music theater, I would love to try and do that again. Let's look out for those opportunities. And I specifically said Phantom because I love the show and I grew up with that soundtrack. And it sounds like Hey, how you did too. And we love to blast that double. <laughs> yep. So as fate would have it, and this is actually another sort of weird thing. My agents at the time were like, oh, you don't want to do Phantom. Phantom's old. You want to do Book of Mormon. You want to do whatever. And now they'd be like, you want to do Dear Evan Hansen. Let's go get it wicked. And I was like, yeah, that'd be cool. But something feels so authentic about Phantom. And I love that. So can we focus on that? <laughs> <laughs> Again, it's all about that, like, authenticity and try yeah. to just like do what your gut tells you. So literally like a week later, what are called the breakdowns come out, which are the auditions of the moment. And here comes Phantom of the Opera. Look, they're auditioning. What? So for a brand new tour and I got called in for Raul, who's the love interest of Christine and the enemy of Phantom. And I was so happy about that because I was like, this is perfect. I don't have to worry about carrying the show it's still a lead but it's not as hard as fan i'm like this is great like this is a great way if i was lucky enough to just sort of dip my toe into this sort of opportunity and so i show up in la where i live but in burbank to go audition and it's a typical setup for a audition which is a table in front of you seven to ten feet away with one to three people staring at you and then you stand by the piano and you sing it's very intimate. It is not fancy. And I was not nervous because my ignorance was bliss. I didn't realize who I was singing for, which is irresponsible of me to not check. I didn't realize it was the U.S. supervisor for all of Cameron McIntosh and Andrew Lloyd Webber's shows. Whoa. I didn't realize that the pianist was the U.S. supervisor for all of <laughs> Andrew Lloyd Webber and Cameron McIntosh's shows. And I didn't realize that the casting director was one of the biggest in the entire industry. If I had, I might have put a little pressure on me, but I also knew that I could sing the crap out of All I Ask of You. So I sang All I Ask of You was no big deal. And they stopped me and they go, no, 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 no. You're a phantom. Can you sing music of the night? And I went, oh, sure. So I read the music over the pianist's shoulder and I sang music of the night. And oh, I, I knew. I love that song. <laughs> yep. And I knew in that moment I was going to move forward with it, but I guess I was well. going forward as a phantom. So I get called back for the final callbacks and that's in New York. So I fly to New York and now I'm definitely feeling pressure, more excitement and pressure. And I really, I want this job, but I kind of can't at the time, like I, I wanted it, but it certainly wasn't in my mind space to be like, oh, I can totally book this. Having never done anything like it before, I... I think right. I just wanted to go in and like do my best. And of course I wanted it, but I didn't expect anything. So now you're at a bigger rehearsal space in New York. It's called Ripley Greer. It's very famous rehearsal space where they're doing Broadway stuff for auditions. And so the way that I work, because I need lots of warm up, I get up so early. If I have to do something, my callback was probably at like 10 and or nine or something horrible to me. So I'd get up probably at like five. And I would go work out and run to get my body moving because that's super important for me when I sing. Absolutely. I would rent a little rehearsal space and start doing vocal warm ups. Maybe I had a voice lesson, but now I'm nervous and I'm, I'm like, okay, watching the clock. I still have like two hours for the stupid audition. I'm like, ah. But lo and behold, I go in. Now there's a whole bunch of people. There might be like 15 people in there, cameras, 
and the director of the show and you're doing what's called a director sort of work session. So of course I'm singing music of the night, but now you get to work with him. They direct you, they give you some notes. They ask you to try it this way, try it that way. And that for me, I'm very okay with, I'm very comfortable with, because now we're just talking as people. Of course, there's a lot on the line, but also I get to still own the room. And that comes with experience and also just the way that I like to be. And in this particular moment, it, I did, and it worked out for me where I just really was and felt this was mine. And so I ended up booking this job and I literally can't believe that happened because now they're sending my audition tape up to Andrew Lloyd Webber and Cameron McIntosh and being like, what do you think? And the fact that they're like, yeah, great, <laughs> really is insane to me. So I was fighting to get a six month run. Yeah. said, no. So a one year. They contract. want years. <laughs> At the time, my wife, we had just bought a house in LA and we had got mm -hmm. the kitchen. We had no counters. And I was like, oh, by the way, I just booked this like dream role. I have to go. She was also in the industry. So she understood, but it was very hard to make that sacrifice and be like, I'll see you every month and then go and do the show. And if you want to talk about mental health, now that I've laid the groundwork on how I ended up on the stage on a tour, this show is big. So it travels every two to six weeks, but that means that every two to six weeks I was reviewed by the local papers. And that was very, very hard for me because the reviews, what makes a better reviewer to say like, I loved it or to be like, I know my theater so well and let I'm going to tear this apart, apart. tear this apart. Yep. And you know where they start or where they end with the phantom because he's the lead of the show yeah. so every two weeks not always, but very frequently. And the other element here is that phantom is so beloved by so many. And yep. a lot of the reviewers are of age where they will never forget this iconic show, this iconic moment. They saw, you know, this particular Phantom was probably Michael Crawford and they, who knows, the show could have been total crap, but their memory of this experience, which I know as a theater lover and goer, you can't beat whatever they experienced. And so they will not let you beat it. So I was just constantly torn apart. And not to mention the fact that I had been on The Voice. So I, I was also given this extra hurdle where people assumed that I just like was given this job because I was not working for like it five yeah. years before. Like, yeah. And so, oh man, I really had a hard time. I really got some major anxiety during that time. And I extended, I did two years, I did 700 public performances and yeah. it worked really hard through that to keep it together because it was hard. Sounds like it. I mean, live theater is such an incredible experience, but it's one of those things that for the most part, the audience and general public has no idea in terms of how much work and energy goes into every show. And then also what an impact it has on your own mental health. And it sounds like you were doing about eight shows a week. It seems like it takes an incredible amount of mental stamina. And then again, you're carrying a legendary Andrew Lloyd Webber production. I mean, talk about stress. Can you give us a little bit of insight in terms of how you balanced carrying such a big show with prioritizing your mental health? I mean, how did you take care of yourself when those moments of anxiety popped up? The first thing that popped in my head, it's a family. That cast is a family. You know, my friend Katie Travis, who was Christine, and sometimes she would feel really allergy and her allergies would be flared or she would have phlegm in her throat and I would feel the same way or maybe we would commiserate literally backstage and be like, how you doing? Checking in with each other and supporting yeah. each other. I also was taking voice lessons from our Carlotta, Jackie Fontaine. And I would say that she really helped me a lot because if I was in a bad place, I would find her and she would talk me off the leads and then I would go back out there or she would say like, I've been listening and maybe tonight you need to lighten up a little bit vocally, lighten yeah. up and get through this. Or this is obviously like in sort of like a chaos place where we're like, Ah, because there's 3,000 people out there, the overture has begun and I don't feel good. Right. What do I do? It's really the worst feeling in the world because you know we have to go out there and deliver something. Everybody's waiting for me to go to be and music of the night. They're just waiting for this one note. So I would put all of this pressure, my entire weight of my world would be on B, which is not a good way to sing. You're not supposed to do that. And so you're just setting yourself up for errors when you're like, all oh, the pressure, if I mess this one thing up, yeah. My whole life is over. But I would say the bottom line is I would rely on my friends. I would find people in a support system that 
happened to be my castmates where if I felt like I needed to vent or I needed some encouragement or if I had a question, I knew I could turn to these people and get a response. I like that idea of just kind of finding those people to reach yeah, out to. Otherwise, people. imagine it'd be so isolating otherwise. Well, it's an isolating role too, because yeah. Phantom is a loner anyway. So I very much always felt in my head and alone because I was. But yeah, you have to have your people that you can rely on when you feel bad. So, and then there were times when I would call out of the show. I can reveal something like the longer I was in the show when I was in the probably like the six to seven hundred number of shows, mm -hmm. I started to forget the words. Oh, wow. It sounds really like opposite of what happens. But actually, when you do something by rote so many times, you start to blank. And so I started panicking, being like, I'm going to forget the words. I'm going to forget the words. I'm going to yeah. forget the words. That was worse than like thinking my voice is going to crack. There were times when I was like, you know what? I got a call out today because I need to go see a movie. Shake up this routine. Yeah. Was so it like I, a sign to yourself? Yeah. You I just may take care of else, yourself. And I have to totally depart from this cast, the show. I need to go to a baseball game. I don't know what I did. I went to Fleetwood Mac one night. I uh, went to a movie or maybe I just need to go to bed. You know, those things. I love it. But mental health days. <laughs> yeah, mental health days. And I think now those are more popular. You know, there are some jobs and I know the athletes are starting to come out about it. And mm -hmm. I'd say that a long running show is another one where it is essentially like you hit your mark and you do it perfectly every time. Yeah. It's a similar situation. No allowances, not much give, it sounds like. Not much give. Yeah. yeah. You know, I want to come back to your role, because as a psychiatrist, I've always been very fascinated with the show Phantom of the Opera. I wonder if you might be able to speak a little bit about how mental health concepts show up in the show and then what it was like for you to embody some of that in playing the Phantom. Well, I mean, the whole story is, boils down to somebody that was bullied and then who acted out in a violent way because of this bullying. So it's quite relevant in culture today and all the mm -hmm. obvious things that have happened over the last 20 years and with the gun violence and what happens in schools and yeah. the internet and how horrible people are to each other. But the Phantom was an outcast who was deprived of love by his own family and was hunted down and bullied by the public to the point where he became murderous. And there was one beacon of hope and that was Christine, his love of his life where he felt happy and she loved him and it is a beautiful story. And at the end, when she comes, obviously he sends her away with Rao when he realizes that he's just gone so far off the deep end and has made so many mistakes that you can't, you know, force somebody to stay with you. And she comes back and instead of running off, she comes back, she gives an engagement ring back to him when he's, you know, down on the ground. And it's a symbol of love instead of kicking him while he's down. She like loves him when he's down. And that was always my favorite moment of the show because it was so vulnerable, yeah. so beautiful. And I loved getting to feel that way. I don't know why. I don't know why I didn't. I loved that moment so much. But the story, there's much mental health there. On the other side, Christine was very dominated by the Phantom and was physically abused by the Phantom. And in a way that a lot of people don't like the show because there is the possibility and potential that he might have raped her in one of the scenes. So it's it's complicated. We all like love to sort of gloss over it. But when you dig in, you're like, what? Wait a second. There's a lot of problems here. Uh, yeah. in terms of <laughs> the relationship issues and the mental health issues and the physical abuse and the physical violence. Definitely brings up a lot of these issues. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. you know, to bring this back to real life a little bit. One of the downsides, I would imagine, of being in the entertainment industry is that sometimes people forget that you're a real person too, not just somebody on the screen or on the stage. How do you handle trolls and bullying and now trolls and bullying online? I try really hard not to read it. It's really hard. And it's really hard to not want to respond. I actually had like a really <laughs> big hope for humanity in the last couple of years. When my videos were going crazy online, I found them, the comments basically void of trolls. And there were hundreds and hundreds of thousands of comments and I couldn't believe it. I didn't understand it. I said, what is all this positivity and where yeah. are these trolls? Yeah. And there's something about the pandemic 
And I don't think it'll last. I'm sad to say, but at the time, I think it was the great equalizer. I think it brought people together. I think people were unified in a way that we haven't been in a long time. And uh, absolutely. And people were laughing and we were laughing together. We were scared together. We were confused together. And they weren't picking me apart in this video. They were actually identifying with them and yeah. seeing themselves in it or seeing someone else and sharing it and laughing and supporting each other. So lately, I feel like I've been very lucky and so proud of humanity for not doing that. However, there were a couple of videos that I did where it was extremely divisive and I was disappointed with people. And one of them was political, where I was stating some strong opinions about the presidential election. And it was very quick, so fast and so aggressive how people literally told me to like go F myself. And I'm a guy. I'm like married. I can't imagine being a woman or a girl or someone growing up or a, a guy or a kid who's closeted or a trans person or anybody who's feeling a little bit different or just a straight person who has the thoughts that they share that then are they're just like against the firing squad because that's where it is. It's so hard and so unnecessary. So now I try not to read it. Yeah, uh, because I like that. the truth is that there for like the one bad comment that I would get, I'll have literally thousands of other ones that are so positive. But, but I, I bet your mind hangs on to the negative. Exactly. That's there's a lot of science around that, too. We have a bit of a bias to hang on to negative memories and negative experiences. 100%. Yeah, I think you brought up something really important, too, about how no matter who you are and where you're coming from, no one's really immune to this. No one's immune to how others treat you and these types of experiences. I want to actually switch gears to focus on our teen listeners today. What advice would you give a teenager sitting in a classroom in Wichita or even in their bedroom in Seattle who's dreaming of a career in theater or music or entertainment? My advice to anybody, a young performer, no matter where you are, is to say yes to every performing opportunity that you have at your disposal. So I sang in my high school. I sang in my local theater company for high schoolers, music theater for young people. I was lucky enough to have a premier professional theater in the city, Music Theater Wichita. There's Crown Uptown. Then there, not to mention the fact that now you have YouTube and the internet where you can put yourself out there and sing. By saying yes to everything, you're going to allow yourself to meet friends, to meet people, to meet contacts that can help you with your goals moving forward. Um, it also allows you to get so much valuable experience. You think you go... I mean, some people do now with the way that reality TV is, but is it better to have your first performance be on national TV or is it better to have a couple under your belt by being at home? You know, right. I would say the former. Just take advantage and enjoy. And also like being on a reality show now does not matter. I'm going to just pop everyone's bubble. It literally does not matter. So if that's the path that you think you need to take to achieve your goals, that is the wrong path. They don't make stars. They're so saturated. The voices on season 2,800 million. And that's not what this is. So I would just say, let's start local and yeah. let's start in real life. Real life, not reality TV, real life. Because that's where those auditions down the road, when you're auditioning for the Phantom of the Opera or you're in New York City, or maybe you're going to your high school audition room, they don't care what you posted yesterday. They care what you're doing in front of them right now. Yeah. And how you're showing up. How are you showing up? You can be a star in your bedroom with no audience. You have nobody to be nervous in front of. You have no experience there. Or you can go out and learn what it's like to deal with your nerves, to be afraid, to be proud, and to be excited about how do you sing when you're really excited? Not everything's negative. What if you're just super excited about it? That could also screw you up. Learn how to sing through that and to get feedback from a professional. So yeah, say yes. And I sang the alma mater at my college graduation. And that is from that audience of people. There was some other student's mother who worked for a record label who came to me and introduced me to my first manager. And that's how I got my first manager after college. And that's how I got my first record deal. So if, if you don't 
say yes, if you don't sing in real life and put yourself out there, then you can't move forward. That's how these wonderful things happen. I love that. So put yourself out there and say yes. Anything else in general about mental health that you'd like to share with our teen audience today? I've met so many of you when I was playing the Phantom and you guys are so beautiful and you're, there's so much hope and joy in your generation. And I would just lean into that and just know that there's obviously so much room for negativity and to be stuck on that. But I would just encourage you to really just find your people and love your people and receive that love from your people. Because whether that's one person or like a whole group of people, that will be your lifeline moving forward. And those will be relationships that you'll have forever. I would just say, don't be so hard on yourself and make sure that you find your people. I love that. Well, thank you, Chris, for spending time with us. It was really, really great to hear about your unique path and where mental health played a role in all of it. Until next time, this is Dr. Neha Chaudhary reminding you to keep being you.